Let's get a few of the people up here to walk quickly through their devices. Perhaps Martin, you'd like to come forward. Associate Professor Martin Norm on behalf of Endoluminal. Give him a round of applause. So this novel way of dealing with leakage in and around the heart, where did you first come up with the idea? I remember this very clearly. I, I was having, well, we be, Ashish and I have been trying to solve this fundamental problem and I, I had a shower one day and it was just an epiphany. Like, you know, you obsess with a problem for so long, it dogs, you know, all your waking hours, even when you're not at work. And, you know, like many people have described, it, it comes in the shower. Well, that's the truth. And so what you're doing here is, trying to prevent leak. How big an issue is leakage at the moment? In what sort of situations does it arise? So, look, my, my, I'm, a, I'm a heart specialist at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and I, I, I lead a, 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 a program that's transformed cardiology in that we've been able to replace heart valves of people without having to open their chest. This can only currently be tri tried for people who are essentially too high risk for surgery because the most significant problem with this technology is that when we implant these valves, very frequently, unfortunately, they leak around the sides. So, you know, a valve has to be, he has to be hemodynamically competent. In other words, it's going to let blood out in one direction, not let blood back. And if you're going to leak, you know, your patients don't do so well in the long term. So, you know, this technology has, has two major impacts. It allows my patients, improves the survival and outcomes of the patients I can currently treat. But I can't treat a lot of patients who are normal risk right now because you know, they'll do better with surgery because my, my percutaneous valve leaks. Now, if I have a valve that solves these leaks, I open the door to treating a lot more people, Australian people, with, with heart valve technology that gets them out of the hospital one or two days as opposed to 10 days. And that's a dramatic improvement. With, with the membrane, what is it that makes it expand? What, what's in the membrane and, and how does it know how to expand? So once, once the valve is in, we've, we've put a lot of work into this to make it work precisely and safely, but also in a kind of no-brainer way. You know, it's the, we believe that the essence of medical technology innovation is that you can't burden the procedures with too much complexity so they'll never use it, but it also has to be just right. So once the device is in place and, it, and the membrane has little holes that open, uh, that expose part, the, the, a polymer to blood, it then, the, the polymer, a polymer then comes around and conforms to all these cracks that can't be sealed by a, a stiff device to solve the leak. It can't, sounds kind of simple, but it also takes quite a lot of work. And so when audiences around the world, we've heard about the prizes and the receptions you've been getting at conferences, what are they reacting to? What are they saying is so good about this proposal? Well, look, for, for all of us who are involved by the, with this, you know, this, this is a, a critical, life-threatening problem with this device. It's the number one problem. And when we show this, we were the first group to ever try and work on this problem. In fact, we anticipated this problem before this technology became clinically used, uh, which is why we have the leg up on the world. Uh, the reception has been unanimously great. And with the $2.5 million, while it's always difficult to predict the exact timeline of trials, etc., where, where, where do you need to get to next? What's the Look, it allows step? us to, to fast track the development of our technology and prove it so that we can you know, go on to clinical trials to, to treat people with it. It's very exciting. I can remember the moment that you and Ashish walked out of the room, the panel all sort of looked at each other and went, oh, yeah, that's pretty good, that stuff. <laughs> Give him a round of applause, Associate Professor Martin. Great to see you, Martin. Thank you very much. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Saluda was the next device that we saw in the video there. John Parker, would you like to come forward and tell us about um, Saluda, sorry, John Parker, Chief Executive Officer of Saluda, the spinal implants for pain management. Where did you get the idea for that fascinating device? Um, it's actually a very old idea. Uh, so neuromodulation for pain management's been around for maybe 35, 40 years. Um, What's different about what you want to do? Um, so what we're doing is um, we've, we've actually built devices that don't just stimulate the nerve, but we can, or the spinal cord, we can actually sense what the spinal cord does in response to that stimulus. That's the crucial difference, isn't it? That's what we were saying about rather than manual response from the patient making the adjustment, what your, your device hears from the body what it needs. What it needs, precisely. And so it is, it is a closed loop uh, neuromodulation system. So it's actually a, a device that uh, not doesn't just stimulate, but also in real time records what's happening to the stimulus and then adjusts the stimulus on an ongoing basis, continuously and in real time. 
and even closed loop, uh, the idea of closing loop, closed loop uh, devices, and that's not a, not a new idea at all either. Um, that's around, but it's a holy grail in neuromodulation and it hasn't been achieved before uh, we've done it. And when it comes to the management of chronic pain, I get the impression that despite our best attempts, we're still a long way behind with chronic pain, aren't we? Uh, very much so. So Professor Michael Cousins is here in the, in, in, in the audience and that's his at Royal North Shore. He's our, uh, our clinical partner and um, the, uh, the the, the sort of the people that end up being treated, a very, very small percentage of people actually get treated with neuromodulation or electrical stimulation. Um, the vast majority of people get treated with, um, with, high, with potent analgesics. Um, the cost of pain um, in Australia is enormous um, and in New South Wales it's also uh, extremely significant. And there's the social impact of living with someone who has chronic pain, there's things they can't do and everyone else has to cover for them and make sure that they, you know, they, can, they can't do the dishes, they can't do things in the backyard they might want to do and the whole, the whole family's life sometimes is structured around trying to help one person manage this very complex situation. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, there, there, there are people can't work if they're in chronic pain. Um, and so neuromodulation is often the last resort for these people as well. They, they, they're refractory to the other, the other treatments. But even today, after 30 years of neuromodulation for pain, um, the market's still only about 7% penetrated by, by most of the figures. The other interesting thing in the video that people would have noticed was the suggestion that not just conditions that cause people pain, but I heard Parkinson's and things like that mentioned. How could a device like this move into things beyond just treating pain? So there are treatments. So neuromodulation is used for Parkinson's, it's used for epilepsy, it's used for a whole range of disorders. So, um, and in every one of those disorders there's some neurally active tissue, a neuron, um, a nerve, a piece of brain, and uh, these devices all apply some kind of stimulus to them in order to get some kind of response. And everywhere that's done, um, there's a potential to do closed loop control of that and eliminate a lot of the variability that's attached to those sorts of therapies. And we've actually done some, some tests with Parkinson's disease and some of these other areas as well. How long have your team been working on this? You say the whole field of electromodulation neurostimulation has been around for a while, but how long have you been working on this approach and where to over the next couple of years? So we've been working on this for, uh, from NICTA, um, we had a, an implant systems group in NICTA. We've been funded for about four years now um, at NICTA. Uh, beginning of the year, we just span out a company. Um, the MDF fund is really going to be critical. Um, that money is going to help us go from laboratory um, tests, um, devices that like that little backpack that we uh, currently use with with uh, with our clinical um, acute clinical studies patients, and actually build an implant and and uh, go that next step towards commercialisation. Exciting stuff we're going to be looking on with great interest. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Professor John, Dr John Park and the team from Saluda there. Next in the video was Moby Drip by Moby Life. If Professor Paul Dastor would like to come forward, give him a round of applause. Professor of Physics at the University of Newcastle. So it was, in the, it was the one that was the third video we saw there. And when people ask you in 25 words or less, what's, what's Moby Drip, what do you say to them? Well, it's a, it's a device that's very, very simple, actually, in terms of technology. What we do is we just surround a fluid bag with a, a, a pressure and squirt that into people. And that propellant method, the video said that that was, that was more effective, more accurate than the traditional and what's an ambulatory pump and how is your thing more effective? Yeah, so um, there are a variety of pumps that you can use. Ambulatory means you carry it around with you. And if you've got one of these pumps, you can go home, right? You can go home really fast. You want to stay in hospital. They're dangerous places <laughs> full of sick people. Um, so you get to go home faster. That saves uh, funding and, and so on. So um, you can do that in one of two ways at the moment. Essentially, uh, you either have what we call a, a, an elastomeric device, which is basically a balloon in a bottle squishes the drugs into you, or a computer-based pump. The balloon is inaccurate and cheap, and the computer is accurate and expensive. We're cheap and accurate. <laughs> what are your sort of measures? What are your sort of... So the flow rate is, is more accurate than the computer-based pumps, and the cost is less than the elastomeric pump. And so the benefits there are potential faster discharge from hospital, of course, saves the state and the hospital money. But, but that sense of well-being for patients, being back at home quicker or maybe back at work quicker than being stuck chained to a device in a hospital exactly, must be great. Exactly. Instead of being stuck in a hospital bed for you know days on end, 
just having antibiotics, for example, uh, pushed into you. Now you can go home, you can get on with your life, and indeed you, you, you're less likely to catch other diseases while you're in hospital. It's comparative. It's the smallest of the grants being given out. Does that mean that you're closer to completion or what you're doing is any easier than the other things you're looking at? Yeah, so all we wanted to do was to take our current device, which is already in hospitals in New South Wales and, and Queensland as well, actually, Adam, sorry. That's right. <laughs> um, and now, at the moment, what we have to do is, is it comes back to base every three months to get recalibrated, to get that pressure reset. We'd like to redesign the inside so that we can make sure that it only comes back, say, every year. What that means now is we can then uh, see about this device going international. I was going to say, are there international projects oh, already absolutely. doing this or chasing at your heels? Yes, yes. So we've already got uh, interest from South Africa about getting healthcare to people who don't have any healthcare at all, right? Especially from a device that doesn't require any power. So we were talking very recently about getting this device to uh, villages in South Africa where they have to walk days to get to a, uh, a clinic. But they don't have any power, so imagine having an infusion pump which they can just power with a gas cylinder. Well, as a member of the committee, it's really exciting to know we might have in some way gone towards you realising that dream. Give him a big round of applause. Great stuff, Paul. <laughs> Professor Paul Daskell from the University of Newcastle. HearWorks, the audio package. Professor Robert Cowan, please come forward. Tell us about HearWorks. Give Robert a round of applause. A testing regime for people with hearing difficulty or no hearing? Uh, very much correct. We know that uh, for children, it's critically important that we're able to detect uh, hearing loss and accurately fit devices within the first year of life to give them the, the real opportunity um, to be just like you and I, a hearing person well engaged in the community and being successful. I guess as I get older, I get concerned about the other end of the spectrum, uh, where we, we really realize that this has a lot of application for uh, elderly patients as well, who may be being incorrectly assumed to have dementia, when in fact uh, they may have a hearing or auditory processing problem that uh, this device will be able to detect and better direct management. Do you think that, is that sort of inaccurate diagnosis commonplace at the moment? Can dementia be confused for hearing loss? Well, it's very easy to, uh, to um, uh, confuse the two. Um, we've, we're only just realizing how common and how important uh, auditory processing uh, disorders are in addition to the, ac uh, the peripheral access. And when this is described as the world's first fully automated and totally objective test of hearing thresholds. What, what, why is fully automated and totally objective so important in this field? Well, HearLab came out of sitting down with the end users, sitting down with the clinicians and saying, what's your problem? And the problems that they were saying was, well, we can't talk to babies. They can't tell us what they hear. We then talked to the, the funding agencies, the hospitals, and they said, we can't afford to hire skilled electrophysiologists. We, and there aren't that many. So we had a number of, of key things that we had to, to work through. How, we knew we had research that we could record babies' brain waves, but we had to do that in a way that, that any technician could do it. Um, so this opens up all sorts of opportunities for using this device e-health-wise. Uh, we can use it uh, uh, you know, in regional and remote centers. Um, it, it opens up many, many different opportunities, and it doesn't require skilled clinicians to use it. That makes the ability to use it in developing countries far more prevalent. So how far are you down the path of this being readily available in a sort of mass market sense? Well, HearLab is, is actually 10 years old. Um, and as uh, we've been investing in this w along with Australian Hearing uh, for over 10 years, um, it's, uh, the, the device itself is uh, a license to fry electronics and has regulatory approval in Europe, in the United States and in Asia and is being used. The key is uh, that we turned the way test equipment is, is developed on its head. Instead of having one unit for each new test, our, our tests are implemented in software modules that can be run on a standard computer. Mm -hmm. So the value is that we've created the opportunity with the MDF funding for um, really to make New South Wales the hub of software development for new test modules. And each new test module that comes out increases the value of HearLab for the groups that are purchasing it. Mm -hmm. And this so without being facetious, not unlike on a, a, an app you've already got on your computer, just being given software upgrades, a new improved version, as opposed to need, needing to buy a new computer every time you guys make another breakthrough. And that's why it's going to be incredibly attractive for groups that have limited funds to put investment into audiological test equipment. It opens the door for one unit to provide multiple tests and get uh, upgrades very easily through software. Exciting stuff. Congratulations, Associate Professor. Robert Cowan and the team at HearWorks. 
And finally in the video, we heard about elastogen. Robert Daniels is going to come forward, the CEO. Give him a round of applause, please. We saw there that the, the video, the compelling video of people dealing with, in particular, burn trauma. First of all, what is elastin? So elastin is a, um, it's a structural protein that's present in a number of tissues in the body. Um, it's essentially nature's elastic band. So it's present as fibres, for example, in the skin. And when you can stretch and the skin can recoil, that's all down to elastin. We all, we all manufacture we all, elastin? As adults, we no longer produce elastin. So it's mainly produced during fatal development and in newborns, but as we get older, we lose that ability to regenerate or replace the elastin in our skin. And, and whilst it's good enough to do the job for most of us for most of our lives, if you have a trauma, like a burn or significant scarring, I presume that's when you run into trouble. What happens is if you, ha if you have a severe burn or a, or a severe injury, obviously the main focus is on you know, keeping the patient alive. But once, once that's been achieved, the next step is actually how do you make their lives more comfortable, more effective? And the scar tissue that's formed after those injuries is essentially not like natural skin. It's very tight, it's very stiff, it contracts. And so if it's in an area like the neck or on a joint, those areas you can no longer move. So you can imagine if you've got a severe scar on your neck and you can't lift your head, then it's, it's, it's you know, not conducive to a good quality of life. And the other thing that is mentioned there in the video in your presentation was you might significantly reduce the number of surgical procedures, because we've all heard in the, in the aftermaths of, of house fires and bushfires, people needing to go back to hospital time after time after time for procedures. Absolutely, and the problem at the moment is uh, the, the surgery that they undergo still uses a type of artificial skin that doesn't enable um, the regeneration of elastin. So that artificial, artificial skin still results in severe scar tissue that over time contracts even more. So what we're able to do is produce a more natural skin that will help that repair process and reduce the number of surgeries they need to undergo. But the moment medical processes start to get into trying to do in a lab what the body does naturally, sometimes what would seem to be comparatively simple things are bamboozingly hard, is, is, it a, is it an easy process to take out of the body and into the lab in that sense? It's, it's not an easy process at, at all and it's, um, it's been something that's been developed over 20 years by Professor Tony Weiss and his team at the Elastin Laboratory at the University of Sydney. Um, you know, one of the fantastic things about working with Elastigen is this huge base of science around the Elastin technology. So you know, it makes my job easier when we start to say, well, how do we make this product? How do we make it work? These guys have done all the science, so you know, it, it's really about working with the clinicians to introduce that into a, a practical way of treating the patients. And, and without being facetious, sometimes when there are breakthroughs in terms of skin and things like that, some people cynically say, oh, all the research will say it's about burns, but then it's just going to be for, play, for people getting surgery to make themselves look pretty and eternally young and things like that. Will this have applications in cosmetic surgery as well? It will do, but, but fundamentally the, the most important thing is, is actually getting the medical treatments right because understanding the science, understanding how the skin is regenerated is, is the most important thing to get right first. There will be flow and benefits to uh, the cosmetic space, but there will be flow and benefits into a whole bunch of other areas as well, so into the cardiovascular, into elastic ligaments, into regenerating bladders. Ela anywhere where the tissue has to stretch and recoil, elastin is the critical protein. $2 million is the grant. Roughly, where is it going to take you? What are you using it for? It'll take us through a clinical trial to uh, get proof of concepts in the treatment of severe scars, um, and that will be sufficient to take us through product approval. Um, we already have industry partners who are interested in you know, pursuing the sales and marketing of this product. And what it means for Elastigen is we can get success stories in one or more products in this area. There are a whole bunch of other things we can do, and you know, the professor at the university and the scientists are already working on next technologies, next applications. Well, so. congratulations to yourself and everyone in the team as part of the Elastigen project. Great work. Thank you very much. Robert Daniels, ladies and gentlemen.